Anyone who's known me for any amount of time is aware that this is how I spend most of my free time. If you don't know what I'm doing here, I'm flipping a rock. I do not do this for exercise, although I do get a fair amount of exercise from it. I don't, I, I don't do it either for the number of confused looks I get from passers-by, and there are plenty of those as well. I do it because there's a lot of wildlife hiding underneath those rocks, and that's some of what I want to share with you today. So first up, centipedes. Centipedes come in many different flavors, but the one ironic thing that they all share in, in, that they all have in common is that none of them actually have a hundred legs. You see, scientists have realized that centipedes can only have an odd number of leg pairs, which means that hundred is impossible. You are, of course, welcome to count if you don't believe me. There are enough pictures on the slide. So the first, these are the four main orders of centipedes. The first three were taken in London, and the fourth in the foothills of the Himalayas. So a bit of an outlier there. It does look like a bit of a Lovecraftian horror, but it's, it's actually a pretty common and effective predator of the tropics. And if you look at those legs, you can see that they're actually kind of optimized so that the thing doesn't trip while it's running. The legs are, the legs are slightly longer than each one in front so that they don't trip when they're you know, pursuing prey. But instead of me droning on about centipede anatomy, I actually have something here I'd like to show you. So in this jar are five I think five um, brown centipedes, which are the most common species in the UK. And uh, he was talking about, you know, getting out of your comfort zone. So if you're scared of them, I especially say that you should definitely look at them. They won't jump out of the jar, so you'll be fine. Uh, the jar has a magnification of the lid, so that should help you. So I'll just pass the jar along. And um, some of the features I want you to look for are the antennae, which are the main sensory organs. The hind legs, which are supposed to look like the head, so that if like a bird grabs it and from the wrong end, it just gets bitten. Um, you've got 15 pairs of legs, not 50, as I explained. And um, they also have these small claws near the head, which are called forcipules, which is what they use to inject their prey with venom. So um, centipedes are primarily predators, and one of the things that helps them in this lifestyle is speed. So this is a centipede that I found in southern India. And you can see this is about half the length of my hand, but you can see how fast it escapes. On the other hand, you've got these blind centipedes called geophilomorphs, and uh, they don't really seem to care that they're blind. And uh, that picture on the right is actually a centipede eating a millipede from the inside. Now, I agree this might be a, quite a grisly image for most of you, but to me it shows how what we consider to be a huge impairment doesn't seem to affect these creatures in doing what they do. Centipedes are also surprisingly good mothers. That's two words I assume you don't think should be in the same sentence. But a lot of species of centipedes actually curl around and protect their young once they're born. Now, I don't have any pictures to show you, but I definitely recommend that you search for this after the talk. It's adorable. Moving on to another group of creatures which have eight legs and quite often eight eyes. Spiders minus one species, the delightfully named Bagheera Kiplingi, after Rudyard Kipling's Jungle Book. All of them are carnivores, so they have different ways of uh, figuring this out. The spider on the left is a jumping spider, and this may sound terrifying to people who have arachnophobia, but they do jump, they're pretty good jumping. This photo was taken on a light switch outside a toilet in northern India, so they're basically everywhere. And there is, uh, if you've ever interacted with a jumping spider and you see those little beady eyes staring at you, you can actually see some level of awareness. You know that they kind of know what's going on, unlike most other invertebrates. There's actually a genus of jumping spiders called Porsche spiders, which feed almost entirely on other spiders and they can actually map their world in 3D. They can create complex attack strategies. So I'm mapping my world in 3D as I walk around. You are mapping your world in 3D as you look at me walk around. But for a spider of that size with those few neurons, it is really an impressive feat that it's able to actually create strategies like that. Occasionally, it just pretends to be an insect and plucks at the web so that the spider thinks it's an insect, comes out and then gets killed. Now here is another interesting thing about spiders, is the fact that they actually need to use hydraulics to move. Like, they don't have the same muscle control that we do. So this is a giant huntsman spider that I found in southern India. There it goes. The interesting thing about this is, this is actually a slowed down version. So that is how fast it actually went. I'll play that again for you. So a spider half the size of my palm, in less time than it takes me to blink, was able to create enough control of the pressure in its body so that it could not only go straight but also make a turn. And if that's not amazing, I don't know what is. 
So um, spiders are also surprisingly good mothers. If you've ever walked around in Hyde Park on a sunny day, you'll see these little black specks running around. These are wolf spiders. And as you can see there, the mother wolf spider, once the babies are born, actually carries all of them on her back. There's another group of spiders called lace weavers. And what they do is they actually, the mother actually offers herself as food for the babies. So, I mean, great parenting, I guess. <laughs> so, um, a large number of spiders are also at home in water. So you've got the raft spider, which is a European spider also found in the UK. And this spider waits on the surface and it uses fine sensory hairs on its legs to kind of discern movement of fish and tadpoles under the surface. That spider, God knows what that is. Nobody's been able to identify it, but it seems pretty at home underwater, so great. And uh, the one thing that spiders are most definitely known for, which is in popular culture often considered a symbol of disarray and you know um, abandonment, is their webs. So spider silk is actually a marvel of engineering. If you look at it from the point of view of tensile strength, which is how well it resists pulling, spider silk is actually stronger than a lot of steels. And I was reading this very amusing study about another species that you can find in Hyde Park, the nursery web spider. And essentially the males kind of give a gift to the females before they mate, and they wrap this gift in silk. And as time went on, these males realized that they didn't really need to put in the effort, so they just started giving fake gifts. And um, the thing there is, because it's fake, they need to wrap it in more silk so the female takes longer to realize. And the female eats the gift while the male mates with her. So the more silk there is, the more time it takes for the female to realize that she's been tricked. So animals that we think, you know, don't really have brains and are kind of just instinctual are capable of such complex behaviors as active deception. So um, now moving on to another group of animals which um, are instantly recognizable. And as anyone who's spoken to me for more than five minutes will know, I am obsessed with these animals. I absolutely love everything about them. There are actually sp some species in the UK. This is the aquatic grass snake, which has eluded me for two years. I've still not found one. That is an adder. And as you can see, the baby is literally dwarfed by a lens cap. These are not very big snakes. I've been within two feet of them, and they're impressive to watch, but they're not very scary. And that is an introduced colony of Escalapian snakes in Regions Canal, which I've also been lucky enough to observe. So snakes are, are very adaptable. You can find them on the ground. In Some of them can even glide. You can see them in the water. But the one place you will not find them is on a plane, except um, one particular instance where a tree snake from Australia um, is said to have hitched a ride on some cargo planes and ended up as an invasive species on Guam. So Darwin's concept of descent with modification is never more clear than with snakes. You've got this creature, which many of you would have thought was a worm at first glance, but you can kind of see its tongue moving around. And you've got the giant pythons, which are you know eight to 10 meters long. And in the middle, you've got all sorts of different forms. So why are we really scared of these glorified ropes, if you think about it? We're scared of them because of venom. So here's a very professional scientific diagram that I've come up with explaining the different ways that, that venom works. So this snake is supposed to be a black mamba. And uh, black mambas have a toxin called fasciculins. And this relies on basically the, the general nervous system principle of a gap between the nerve and the muscle. And in the gap, a chemical called acetylcholine has to be transmitted to the muscle. And um, it's supposed to be broken down after the signal is, is generated. So what this toxin does is it binds to that chemical that has to break down the acetylcholine, and it stops that from happening. So the muscle keeps on getting the same signal, and this leads to paralysis and later death. This is a brown recluse spider, which is a very famous American species, whose toxin can cause blood cells to rupture. And that is a Chinese, Chinese red-headed centipede which blocks potassium channels, another very important way for word to get around in the nervous system. But all of this wouldn't really matter to us if these animals weren't living close to us. We're not really terribly scared of poison dart frogs, even though they could easily kill us as well. We're scared of these animals because they keep showing up near our houses. You've got spiders showing up in UK bathtubs as well. In the east, you've got centipedes coming up in drains, snakes making their, their homes outside human habitation. And this is what worries us. The thing is, we have also been living next to these creatures for so long that we've incorporated them into our myths and legends as well. You've got, of course, Adam and Eve and the serpent. You've got the cyclic nature of time in Hinduism represented by a coiled snake. You've got um, even the Asclepian snakes that I talked about earlier are actually the snakes on the famous medical symbol. And with spiders, you've got the defeated king who takes inspiration from a spider that you know tries to keeps failing and trying to build a web. You've got um, 
In fact, an interesting myth about centipedes, which is actually the only one I could find, in Japan, a giant centipede that lives in the mountains and eats people and whose only weakness is human saliva. I don't know where they got that from. But I would also not recommend trying that with actual centipedes because that's just asking for trouble. So another very scientific professional graph that I came up with. You're welcome to come to your own conclusions from this. But one thing that I've noticed is that we don't really hate a lot of mammals. We hate rats because they carry disease. But we hate snakes, we hate spiders just because of what they are. And this always bothered me. So this is one factor, probably the number of legs. I feel like we're only comfortable in the two to four leg region maybe. But um, there's actually a theory that says that um, snake detection is very important for primates and that it actually gave us a greater chance to survive. But with spiders and centipedes, I suppose it's just more about the fact that we can't really empathize with them. We don't really know um, what they're doing and there's, there's not a lot of you know, sensory organs or anything that we have in common. We don't have antennae, we don't, we don't flick our tongues to, to sense smell in the air. So we, we can't really empathize with them and I think that's, that's the real problem there. So this is a prolific photographer and herpetologist who I know. And he's, these are two encounters with one of India's deadliest snakes, a spectacle cobra. And I cannot stress this enough, do not try this at home. Not that you'd ever have to. But um, the important thing to note here is that in both these cases, the snake is not biting. So when a cobra raises its hood or a rattlesnake does that rattle with its tail or a spider raises its fangs, it's not doing it because it's aggressive. It's doing it because it's scared. It sees a creature that is so much larger than it, and it just doesn't know what to do. And the easiest way for it to, to look larger and to look scary is to do what it does. Now, this is not to say that snake bite isn't a real problem, with 100,000 people dying from it annually every year, according to the WHO. But snake bite is not malicious. And with spiders, um, if you look at this clip, you'll see that if you don't, you know, literally bother them, they just think of you as a tree with a slightly different texture. That's it. So this is a woodlouse spider that I let walk on my hand. I have been within a few feet of an adder and a friend here who actually helped me collect the centipedes today, he has been within a few feet of a highly venomous burrowing asp in Africa and both of us are safe and sound. So, yeah. Unfortunately, when we start to think of these creatures as alien lives instead of things that should be living on the earth with us, this is what happens. So this is the first time I've seen this animal. This is an Indian rock python in southern India and it's lying dead next to a busy road in a city. So you can clearly see that there has been some human intervention there because that's not how a snake would normally die. And it pains me greatly that this is the only time that I have seen this animal in this state. So you might be asking after all this why we actually need these creatures. So this is a jumping spider with a fly that I found on a morning walk in my local patch in uh, southern India. And as anyone who has ever tried to swat a fly will tell you, it is next to impossible. But this creature, without even the use of a web, was able to bounce on and subdue an animal with that speed. So it's the same with snakes because not a lot of animals can actually go into rodent burrows, but they can do it. With centipedes, they're actually surprisingly good at disarming other invertebrates, such as scorpions. And if you think about the physiological effects that I described earlier, for example, a, a nerve channel being blocked, you could actually use that to prevent pain, if you think about it, because pain is also a neural signal. So if something is blocking a signal, that signal could be, you know, a useful signal that tells your heart to beat. It can also be a pain signal. So there have been studies on um, the use of snake venoms and other toxins in, treat in the treatment of pain. And somewhat ironically, the antidote for most venoms comes from the snake venom themselves. You actually inject them into horses or other livestock and then collect the antibodies from them. I think it's sort of reductionist to assess an animal's value by how much it benefits us. But I do think that it's great that we've uh, that we've adapted these philosophies from their design into our uh, lives. So, at the end of the day, what is common to all these three features? They, to me, represent the way that evolution solves similar problems at different scales and in different contexts. But to most people, they're just weird things that move in weird ways and they just don't generally seem to belong on a planet that's ruled by hysterical two-legged apes. <laughs> but, um, I am, of course, an anomaly because I love all three of them. And I, I hope that at least some of what I've said today has convinced you that that should actually be the norm. So the next time you see a spider hanging from your ceiling, or you see a centipede in a jar at a TEDx talk, or you are lucky enough to see a snake crossing the road, don't let fear rule your emotions. Think about, just take a minute and think about how much these animals do. Think about the colorful lives that they lead alongside us, and how they shape the way that we interact with our world. Thank you.